Yo, you are listening to the Money Matters podcast with Jack Mallers and Dylan Lito, brought to you by ourselves. We self-produce this podcast. We do not have any sponsors. So if you'd like to support us, you can do your Bitcoin stuff on Strike. We created that company, what that company does, what we do. We consider ourselves one of the best in the world at Bitcoin. We are a Bitcoin exchange. We are a Bitcoin wallet. We do Bitcoin globally around the world. Now in 70 markets, we've got a really big announcement in a few weeks, adding another really big region. So uh, for us, this podcast is about being a voice of reason, a voice of truth, a voice of Bitcoin. And if you'd like to support us, uh, download Strike. Give it a try. Uh, it kicks ass. And uh, it's it's really, really good at this point. We're really proud of it. All right. This is the second episode of Mailbag Mondays. Mailbag Mon- Mondays. As a reminder, every single Monday, you'll get an episode from Dylan and I at minimum. And we'll be talking about whatever's relevant. We'll be answering your questions that you give us on Reddit, on YouTube, on Noster, on Twitter on all of the social Instagram for all my my homies from Chicago. We'll give you all of the content of what's relevant within money, within Bitcoin, within the world. Uh, and just keep a vocal, honest, open, and fluent conversation with the internet. So with that, the man with the agenda. Yeah, Dill I think uh, I think a hilarious place to start. Sometimes timing just really works in your favor. Uh, we just had Jerome Powell on 60 Minutes with some pretty, uh, I mean, what I would consider to be damning information. Um, Although I think for many of us sitting on the side of Bitcoin, it's not necessarily new. We kind of always assumed things were going to trend this way. It's just interesting to hear them uh, said on national TV uh, by the Fed chair. And so one specific quote that he said that I feel like flew under the radar was plain as day claiming that the United States is on an unsustainable fiscal path, meaning that we have too much debt versus how much money we generate. What does that mean for the United States? Um, I think, I've been telling you for a long time, I think the U.S. is fucked. I think the U.S. <laughs> banking system's fucked. I put out a tweet, actually, I just added to it. I tweeted almost a year ago today. It was March... Gosh, 13th, maybe 12th, 12th, um, when Silicon Valley Bank and uh, the bank term funding program, all of that went down. And I said, the U.S. banking system is utterly fucked and the whole system is botched. And what the conclusion I came to a year ago is that we would enter a new era of persistent inflation in the United States. I, I went through this tweet and I came to the conclusion that you're either going to have to let the banking system collapse, the business cycle complete, all of these things that are dead fail, or you're going to have to bail them out. And when you bail them out, you're going to add monetary supply uh, to what is already astronomical amount and inflation that is setting record highs. And so the bank term funding program is now over. They said they're not going to renew it, which I can give my opinion as to why that is. And the system's fucked. So I guess in his interview, he said uh, that he, I don't know, he considers it a long-term issue and not a near-term. I don't know what that means. Um, (laughs) I don't. It feels Uh, like an issue right now. Yeah. Oh no, mom. Yeah, my my room's messy. I didn't make my bed. That's a long term issue. I don't need to clean my room now. What do you mean? An issue is an issue. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand why it would matter later as opposed to now. Um, but I don't know where to start on this topic. I guess, uh, or if you have any thoughts, I think America is fucked. Yeah, I mean the two percent inflation target. I think is is an interesting target. Um, I don't like. Is that arbitrarily set? Do yes. they just decide that that's kind of quiet enough that most Americans won't realize that yeah. they're being robbed of 2% of their money well, year good, over year? It's a good question. I guess, um, so gold, so I guess rewinding all the way back, and I, you know, sometimes we'll repeat rhetoric on this podcast, but I think repetition is the best way to drive a point home and to educate. Before the current iteration of the dollar, so what we all use today – 
we were on a gold standard, meaning that each dollar represented a piece of gold that you could go, you go to Chase Bank, theoretically, and say, eh, I don't want this $20 bill. I'll take the gold that it's worth. And back on the gold standard, gold actually, quote unquote, inflates one and a half to 2% a year. At the current price that gold is at, we find, as in humanity, one and a half to two percent more. We add to its stockpile that much. Now, would you say then gold is an inflationary currency? Well, clearly, yes, it's more inflationary than Bitcoin. But what's important to understand is the growth that humanity is pacing towards was more than two percent. Right. So everything around you becomes deflationary because we as humans were producing more children and building more shit and innovating with more technology to make a one and a half to two percent inflationary money that was bound to the phys physical realities of mother nature reasonable and so i don't know if the two percent or actually low let's pick three percent has any science to it it was that low inflationary currency or money was always the best we can find uh, and it was justifiable because of the rate and pace of humanity, which arguably is because of fossil fuels. And we, you know, humanity is all about taking energy from the sun, commercializing it, and then growing. Right. And so the latest of that of the last 200 years is fossil fuels. And so we were kicking ass, we were growing, and we found a rock that was hard to make more of. And that's, I, I think, where that number came from. But you're right, it is kind of... It's it, like... Yeah. Well, especially when you're unbounded in creating more, um, what's a target? I don't know. Yeah. I target, <laughs> I'm going on to the basketball court and I target two points. Okay. You want to target three? Sure. Target one? Okay. I mean, it's a weird self, uh, self-directed metric. Um, but yeah, gold, I think historically, but I mean, the uh, money, which I think we is a agenda topic after this money is typically the hardest the hardest money to create more of is the money that society almost always settles on and so that gold was that and found itself it's interesting gold doesn't have a central bank so you're not no one directed gold at one and a half to two percent if the price of gold goes up a lot we actually end up finding more gold because it's more economically reasonable to go find more if it's worth more so it doesn't have a fixed uh, rate of future supply um, but it, as we were using it in recent society, it's been around 2%. And so what's the relationship between Fed rates and inflation? So they said that they needed more confidence in the market to then turn around rates and doing so would bring us closer to achieving 2% inflation. Well, I'm not a finance guy. So that part to me is like just a little bit over over my head i don't i don't necessarily understand the correlation very well yeah well they're um they're full of shit um <laughs> all of this stuff is the conclusion that they end up having to come to is the government needs to print money and so you justify that however you want but that is modern day economics is that the government must print must issue more currency go to more war or whatever um so they're f full of shit I guess to understand what happened, we'll just walk through it step by step. So you have uh, COVID, the great monetary stimulus. They printed and injected more money and more liquidity into the system than ever before at such a fast, egregious rate. Uh, and let's walk through then what happened. Everyone didn't necessarily lose their jobs. You just started working from home. You just had a fuck ton more money. And you did one of two things. You spent it or you deposit it in your bank. But even if you spent it, the business that accepted it, it deposited it into their bank. Right. So what ended up happening is an egregious amount of new U.S. dollars entered the, entered the financial system and ended up as bank deposits. <clears throat> now, what do banks do with your deposits? Do they put pieces of paper in a vault with a passcode? No, they, didn't. they do not. The way that banks monetize you and make money is they lend out your deposits. Fractional reserve banking is I'm going to keep a fraction of my reserves at, on my actual balance sheet as liquid cash, and I'm going to take all of these deposits and use the money to make money. 
the best way for banks to do that, and the government and the Federal Reserve incense this by the way that they set banking regulations, is by buying government debt, by buying treasuries. Uh, they do that because I can use, in a, if I'm a bank, I can use an insane amount of leverage and a lot of accounting tricks when I buy treasuries versus like Apple stock, for example. So I get to do all sorts of fucking insane shit. I can buy on leverage. I don't have to, I guess I don't have to post that much collateral to buy an insane amount of treasuries. And the way I get to account for them when they're underwater, uh, I also can kind of not mark them to market and I don't have to actually count them for what they're worth in that moment. So the government and, and the central bank help banks buy these treasuries, if this is all making sense. Yeah. And the last thing is it's the least risky. If I'm a bank, I'm not a hedge fund. I'm not trying to take risk. The U.S. government can't default in their own currency because they'll always bail me out, right? And so what you had is a ton of money printed. That money ends up being bank deposits. All of these banks then lend that money back to the U.S. government in the form of buying these bonds. So far, so good. So the government creates money mm -hmm. during, let's use, let's say with the COVID example, because I remember very fondly, it was like the coolest thing ever for a lot of people. Out of nowhere, they got this $1,200, $800, I can't remember the exact amount, but it was just like yes. direct deposited into your bank account. Yes, but you also have to keep in mind that that's not, when you say printing money, it's not actually, it's liabilities. So Yes, they did print money and they gave it to all of us, your stimulus checks and everyone punted GameStop on Robinhood. Yeah. But the way that you also print money is if interest rates are zero, that means the cost to create more money is nothing. And so I can go in and get a loan at zero interest rate. I could, I could borrow money for free. for free. So borrowing money, extending credit at no cost is effectively increasing the supply. Right. So everyone could raise a seed round. Everyone was growth, growth, growth. Everyone was starting a hedge fund. Everyone was starting a side business. To get a billion dollar valuation and never generate a yeah. dollar. And then I can take my $1 billion startup, my startup's worth $1 billion, and then I can borrow against that valuation and buy a penthouse. And then all of a sudden, I'm levered to the tits on yeah. free money because there was no actual cost for me to economically create. And so, yes, there were stimulus checks, but also they had interest rates. I think it was at 5,000 year lows. Um, they were incenting. They were trying to stimulate. I mean, they didn't want. I mean, sometimes I get shit for um, making fun of old people. I'm a, hu I'm a human lover. I love everybody. But, you know, you guys fucked up a lot of shit and then birthed me into it. So I got to give you shit sometimes. <laughs> I don't think they wanted boomers to get sick and die they're they're <laughs> according to the data sorry no offense they're fat and they're old and they they made a pledge to take care of them yep and so i think they're like shit i don't know if this thing's gonna wipe out all these fat old people that have all of the wealth we talked about this all of the wealth in this country is stuck in assets like real estate so these fat sick boomers that we need to take care of um, are going to die if they go outside. So everyone get the fuck in your house and so that you don't go crazy and you don't ha create civil unrest. We're just going to give you a bunch of money. Go download Robinhood. And that's what happened. What happened? Yeah. I mean, and so the government creates money, deposit it into people's accounts. The banks then take that money and buy debt from the government. No, well, yes, but the the way to think about it is a bond you get a uh, principal plus interest. So I'm buying an instrument. Let's say I'm buying a two year or a five year or a ten year or a thirty year, and they're giving me uh, two and a half percent, three percent. That means if I put in a hundred bucks and it's two and a half percent, then I get my hundred dollars back after it expires plus two and a half percent of interest. So it's a way to monetize basically what you're saying. So I say buying debt is that the government is saying, loan me your money and we're going to use it as the U S government to create an incredible 
country and growth, economic prosperity and humanity, and we're going to find new energy and we're going to create new technologies, and then we'll be able to pay you back with interest because the capital you're giving us now will be able to enter that future state with more value than we do today. And your capital helps us get there. So we're bolstering the economy. Now, anyway, that we haven't been growing for quite some time. Right. Um, the human population is declining. The U.S. Uh, life expectancy is declining. And so it's a load of garbage. But what if I'm a bank, if I'm a bank executive, COVID was lit. That was when I got my big bonus. That was when I was hosting. Biggest inflows ever. All the biggest inflows ever. And then I go buy a bunch of bonds that guarantee me the the joke is that they're risk free because you're lending to someone who can't default. If your friend asks you, hey, can I borrow $100 and that guy can't default? Sure. You take as much as you want. You take my left lung. You can't default. There's yep. no credit risk. Yep. Now, the trick is they they because they can print their own currency, they can bail everything out. But if I'm a bank, I don't give a shit. I'm in bed with these guys anyway. If I'm a bank executive, my job is to collect deposits from the public and give it back to the government. That's why they won't let the banking sector fail. If the banking sector fails, you got to think, who's bailing out the government? All of us. A bank's job is to collect our deposits, keep us warm and cozy and safe, put, you know, their logos are going to be blue. They're going to not be called strike. They're going to be called Bank of America of Trust. And they're going to take your money and give it right back to the U.S. government. And that's their job. And so I put all of these deposits in risk-free interest. So then I forward project my revenue growth. And I'm getting a big fucking bonus. I'm buying myself a Lamborghini. And that was 20 a la 2021. Every, and so also just as we tell the story, everyone was flying high. People were working from home. So they were not doing that much work and still getting paid. They're playing one side of the screen was TikTok and Xbox and Uber Eats and the other was work. They were getting paychecks. They were getting stimulus from the government. The banks were getting bonuses. The government was getting money lended to them. What's the issue? You'd have to ask yourself, if you can create infinite money, what's the problem? Well, then inflation shows up. That's yep. the problem. If you print currency... There are more, there's more money competing for the same amount of goods. So unless we were producing more shit, which by the way, guys, means humans, not like, all right, hurry, let's farm more chickens so we can make more eggs. You can't print 18 year olds. Yep. It, it takes, you know, 20 years to make a, an adult in America. I don't give a fuck how much money you print. That thing's got to come out of a vagina and it's got to go through puberty. It's got to throw a baseball with his dad. <laughs> You can't it print a while. You can't print those. Yeah, yeah. So unless you have more people creating more stuff and ready to consume more things, printing money is going to result in inflation. And so what happens? Janet Yellen and Joe Biden say, hey, Powell, come in my office. And they grab them right by the balls and they say, fix this shit because we're not going to get reelected if you don't turn around inflation. And so for all this like, Oh, Jerome Powell calls the shots. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Oh, politics aren't involved with monetary policy. Fuck, go fuck yourself. They said that now that's when you get civil unrest. Now, can I, you, that's a very politically reasonable thing to do to say, oh, everyone's pissed because we locked them in their homes, inflated everything. And by the time we let them outside, they can't afford groceries. Oh, I'd be pissed too. Okay, well, you got to <laughs> fix it. And this is the cycle of central banking. So then what does he do? He goes and he jacks interest rates up. So the cost to, of capital was zero. And he raised rates faster than ever before. In, in a record amount of time, rates went north of 5%. Now, that causes an incredible amount of pain to all of the TikTokers that started Airbnb businesses, all of the startups that weren't actually generating revenue, all of the businesses that were just hiring people and giving everyone free donuts and free Ubers and free holiday parties. People are getting fired. Businesses are shutting down. People are missing mortgage payments. Um, but that is what needs to happen if you need to, if you need to bring inflation down, according to a central bank. The biggest problem is what happens to the bond market. Now, 
you're sitting at home and you're like, okay, I, let's say, have $100,000 in Chase Bank. Wait a second. If I put it in a Fidelity account and lend it directly to the Fed, I'll get 5.5% in a money market fund. Why would I have it at Chase? Chase isn't giving me, Chase gave me zero. I'm taking my money out. I don't want my money at Chase. Okay, right? And so everyone starts taking their money out of the banks. The banks don't have your money like we just described. They have them in the form of, they took your money and they bought these bonds. The bonds now are fucking trash, down 20, 30, 40%. Why? Because if I bought a bond, you have to also have to understand bond math and how these things are traded. If I bought a bond at 2.5%, and now I can, rates are 55 6, 7%. How how much is your two and a half percent bond worth? If I if I tell you, Dylan, here, you can buy a ticket that says you give me ten dollars, I'll give you twelve and a half back. And then this this ticket, you can go exchange this ticket and say, hey, if you want this ticket, you know. So, a customer, you you run a bank. A customer gives you money, right? Ten dollars. You take that ten dollars. You lend it to me, and I say I'll give you twelve and a half in a future date. Okay. And then I change the rules and I say, oh, now I'm selling tickets for 15 back if you give me 10. Who wants your ticket? No one. No one. Yeah, I'm fucked. But it's your customer's deposit. So then that same guy, so that ticket, which was trading at $10, is now trading at 5 Right? Because mm. the it's a free market. The market's like, I don't want this fucking trash. Yeah, why would I? I, can I get don't a want one. it. And so when your customer says, wait a second, I want my money back out of the bank. I'm going to deposit it into Fidelity and at the Fed. The Fed fucked their own banks because they raised rates so fast after stimulating so much money in that they just, the bond market went way underwater. And so what happens? Silicon Valley Bank. Everyone goes, the first bank was Silvergate. Right. But... I think Silvergate probably went over. Yes, all because of all this, but you know FTX. But um, Silicon Valley Bank, everyone was like, "Give me my money! Give me my money! Give me my money!" You yeah, got they all literally had a bank run. Yeah, well, you have all these startups that are like, I mean, like, like us, like, hey, let's put our money in a money market fund. We're fucking getting five and a half percent or whatever. It's incredible. And take the money out. Take the money out of every single bank account. And then what happens? If these guys have your deposits on something that's worth half, then they don't have your money. And so what happens? The U.S. government and fucking uh, Jerome Powell and the central bank have their stuck. So the entire banking sector is underwater. No one has your money. They took your deposit. They bought bonds. Those bonds are worth less. So if you go and say, I want my money back, and they have to sell those bonds, they're not going to have everyone's money. So your money's gone. Everyone in America, your money's gone. It's not there. That's insane. It's gone. Gone. Doubly so is that the U.S. and the central bank does not want the bond market to sell off even more. <laughs> it's already, f aw it looks awful. The 60-40 portfolio of bonds are safe. If you have excess money, just lend it to us is all of a sudden for the first time, at least while I've been alive, is becoming questioned. Like, wait a second. There are people that give money to money managers, hedge funds, Ken Griffin, 60-40, right. 60-40, 60-40. They're like, whoa, wait, wait, wait. I'm getting murdered. Is 60-40 safe? Is the bond market safe? China's not buying our debt. Japan's not buying our debt. Germany's not buying our debt. And the U.S. banking system is fucking insolvent. So they don't have, the U.S. banking system doesn't have any money to lend out anymore. They're bankrupt. They're broke. So hold on. So that's the bank. So the government creates the bank term funding program, bails them all out. But anyways, they're stuck. Is that, Here's the problem. You can keep rates high and you can drive down inflation. And you're going to crash everything that we know. You're going to all the banks, all the airlines, every business that you reasonably 
use and that's fully institutionalized will fail. And we will go through the Great Depression and the American Empire will die and we'll start over. Can't do that. Or you will bail them all out and Bingo. inflation's not going to be 2%. Inflation's going to continue at all time highs and everyone's fucked. And my personal opinion watching this jackass on 60 Minutes <laughs> is um, here's what you can't do. You can't. So they, they end the bank term funding program. You cannot, in an election year, be on the side of Wall Street. You can't do that. So, right? Elizabeth Warren. Right. Like, this is the f- her and Jamie Dimon at that Bitcoin hearing. This is the first time I've ever agreed with you, Jamie. It's very politically wrong to be on Jamie Dimon's team. You cannot do that. Of course. So, you cannot say, hey, bank term funding program, we're going to extend it. Um, because one, you're admitting that the banks are fucked. Uh, and also, it's an election year. They cannot vow and say, we're going to infl- continue to inflate your groceries to protect the banks. So what do they do? They end the program, and they put this fucking old man on 60 Minutes and says, we're not going to cut rates. 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 It's like, Jesus Christ, how many times you got to say, say it? If you're not going to do it, then just don't do it. Don't fucking tell me 100 times. Unless you're going to do it and you're just <laughs> ma- you're just making sure on my television that you tell me you're not. But as soon as one of these banks fail, then you're going to have to come save the day. That's m- my personal speculative opinion mm. is that th- what they're waiting for is for someone to go under is as soon as they said that they're not renewing the bank term funding program. Then what was it? New York Community Bank or something opened 40 percent down. All of these banks are insolvent. They're going to get murdered. And it's the politically correct thing to do to say, we're saving you. Do you want your deposit? Do you want your money? You keep 100 grand in Chase? You want your money? I can save you if you want, but then you're going to not be able to afford your groceries. Mm. Instead of, I created this mess, I fucked you. I've already stolen from you. You just haven't realized it. But I got to get these guys reelected. But that's, so that's my, that's my personal take on this whole thing. The banks are screwed. They've been insulted. By the way, how do you know that? We just lived through an inflationary year in 2023. How do I know that? Bitcoin was up 160%. Guys, Bitcoin tells you the truth. Sometimes, honestly, like when Bitcoin's up 4% or something, I'll sit there and I'm like, the world's healing. Like the world is, is moving into this new fair equitable system. <laughs> and when Bitcoin's down 4%, it's always telling you something. So the S&P 500, so we're, we're bringing inflation down. We're really um, building const- economic constraints around people. People are feeling the reality of money being hard to create more of but S&P 500s at all time highs. No, no, no. Last year was inflationary. The market sniffed it all out. The bank term funding program was inflationary. Bitcoin reacted to it immediately. As soon as they came out with that thing in March, I mean, we run a Bitcoin exchange. Yep. Bitcoin went up 30% o- overnight. It yep. was like, "Oh, okay, bail out. Boom, gone. See ya." Uh Bitcoin 30%. And then it through the, the whole year, 160%. Went from 18,000 to 45,000 or whatever. And so my opinion is, uh, and by the way, the CPI is wrong. Everyone should go to, uh, hold on, let me find it. I was just on it, actually. Everyone should go to shadowchart.com, shadowstats.com. It shows, um, it's really interesting. The government changed the way they account for inflation uh, between the eighties and 2000. And so what did change? Um, sorry, I'm just a tangent now, but, uh, I didn't know this. So I just learned of this actually, and I was just browsing it and I was looking up this economist. Um, his name is, I would just watch an interview of him. His name is John Williams. So there's this social security, uh, there, there was this, uh, the, the government basically said, if you're old as fuck, these are the type of promises that the government's made over many, many years that's just borrowing from future de- generations with debt that they can't pay back. 
So they told a bunch of old people, hey, when you retire and you social security checks and stuff, we'll keep up with inflation because we're telling you, you don't need to work anymore. Which again, like think about it. Like how do I get elected? I'm going to tell you, hey, you vote for me. You don't, have, you to don't have to work. Yeah. And you're like, well, what the fuck? Like ever since you guys left the gold standard, housing and food, everything keeps getting more expensive. How am I not going to work? We'll write you a check every single year and we'll match it to the CPI. So if housing gets more expensive, you'll get more money. Boom, that guy's elected. And then that guy's out of office and we're all fine. And you and I are born and we're fucked. So what, what they did is they realized like, shit, we owe these old motherfuckers a ton of money. We got to change the way this thing is accounted for. It's the, it, it was the equivalent of like, um, oh, the Chiefs lost to the Ravens. They only scored three points. Well, if you don't, count their touchdowns yeah Yeah, they did but (laughs) that's not how the game is played so they just changed the rules of the game and so they changed the way so this guy uh john williams if you go to shadowstats.com he has the inflation rate of what it actually was before they changed the rules and so they're touting like you know a little above three percent but his shows eleven percent And of course, that's still a cherry pick basket. What was the inflation rate of Bitcoin? 160%. So anyway, um, shadowstats.com. I just was digging into it. It's fascinating. I didn't know. These are the type of promises that were made before I was born. A bunch of fucking old people voted someone into presidency so they didn't have to work and they were going to get checks that kept up with uh, CPI. And then the government changed the rule so that they uh, could save their balance. What are these people doing? Well, it's politics. Yeah, but you sitting here and explaining sort of the underpinnings or inner mechanics of how this whole system works. If you didn't tell me that this was about the largest economic powerhouse sovereign nation on planet Earth, I would think you were talking about some fucked up video game. Well, I think and I what are these people doing. I think the American empire is coming to an end. And we actually, in our very first episode of this podcast, we talked to Jack Dorsey about it. He had this really infamous tweet of like end of an empire. And he goes on to explain like, and it's taken me longer to kind of come around to where he was at. But I agree. I think that, and you kind of, you, you see this very often is that like an empire um, has a, a, a lot of, um, accessible growth in production for whatever reason. Like ours was World War II, um, the industrial growth in production here after the Great Depression. Like we were great. Well, just like after the Great Depression. I mean, the Great Depression built a a core foundational base of a real economy. People had to produce real things. Right. uh, And we then, and we had like great founding principles and World War II went the way it did. And, that, but then you exhaust easy productivity and then the debt catches up to you. Like that's, you know, the Roman Empire failed that way as well. Is like, I mean, in, in more layman's terms, like you're lit, you're the man, everyone loves you, you get whatever you want. And then all of a sudden you're not the man and you don't course correct. Because here's, here's, here's the thing that I think is hilarious. Like this election to me is already telling is like, we're all we're, like we're shopping for fucking like no one likes Biden, no one likes Trump, no one likes RFK, and it's like <laughs> um the the guy in Argentina. Oh uh, yeah, what's yeah. his name? A Malay. 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 It like if someone if I were to run for president and I were to come out and say, all right, here's the plan. Uh, the price of gas going up it's got to because by the way the only reason it was down is everyone forgot trump bought a bunch of oil and put it into a reserve for us so that he could get reelected, and that's why it's been affordable for so long the reason oil prices are going up is because that reserve has been emptied yep so it's all a political fugazi the price of oil has got to go up hey old people your social security shit sorry i'm not like my future kid is not going to be broke and poor and in war to to buy your groceries. I don't know who promised you that. That was ridiculous. I'm taking that out. Um, 
I'm reforming the Fed. I'm reforming the CIA. Um, fuck. Like, I would never get elected. No. I would God, never. No. I mean, you'd get deep. Like, you'd say, you know, the media would do what it does best. Well, I mean. but, but yeah, right. And so now you have these clowns. So at the, the reason that I think it's pretty. But that's, to me, Argentina is a foreshadowing of what will. Well, they're a leading indicator of what we'll go through. They had first like very inflationary times, then hyperinflationary times, right. and then enough civil unrest where a guy walked up and said, I'm blowing up this whole fucking thing. And everyone was like, oh, you got my vote. We're not there yet. Right. But if I were to that, that would be my presidential campaign. I'm blowing this thing up like we have to start producing things in this country again. Real things. Uh, we need to open like like. We need to get on a Bitcoin standard. The price of oil is going to be the price of oil. I can't promise you, Jack Dick. By the way, who gave you a promise in the first place? Like these kids on TikTok crying, oh, I, I went to U of I and I can't um, afford a Range Rover? Who told you you could? You haven't done dick in your life. Like I need a man to give me a big diamond ring. Who says, according to who, sweetheart? Right. Because you were born in Illinois, in Chicago? You don't deserve shit. <laughs> and you got to, no, I mean, what have yeah, you? Yeah, I don't think you're getting elected. You're, you're, At least not yet. sorry, you piled up six figures worth of debt and you work for a staffing company and you want a two car garage that guzzles oil and every internet subscription and you want to be a stay at home parent in a gated community and you work in staffing and carry $100,000 of debt to party at a, at a public university because you got an education degree? Yeah, no, no. I don't know who promised you a life of prosperity. Sorry. This shit's got to get blown the fuck up. That's, to me, what the Malay guy, he was like, and mm -hmm. the central bank, and the shit. We're not there. Where are we? Where it's like, well, you can have Biden. Well, I don't like that motherfucker. He just inflated everything, and he's old, and he can't ride a bike. Oh, okay. You can have Trump. But, oh no 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 no! He's racist and he, he he's evil and he doesn't like women. Oh okay, you could have a Kennedy. Kennedy? Come on, a Kennedy? No, I don't like his voice. Yeah, he's crazy. No, he's yeah, he's, I don't like the way he talks about COVID. I don't like his voice. Ooh, okay, you could have uh, Ramaswamy. Like no, he no fuck he he's on Fox too much. Oh okay okay. And it's a, it's a clown a lot. It's clown. Literally. Like, we're literally. What, like, and to me, this is a now enough civil unrest where it's all starting to unravel, in my opinion. It's like newsflash. None of these motherfuckers matter. The problem, in my opinion, is the money. The problem is the post-World War II. The problem is the empire no longer has easy productivity gains. We don't have anything left. Like... There's no, our population's in decline. Our life expectancy is in decline. Global, like, production, everything that I wear and use was not produced here. is produced in China. Right. It's over. Um, yeah, I mean, again, just going back to, like, the, the video game comment, I mean, it just sounds like none of this is, like, real. And it turns out not only is it, it's our reality, um, one that one that we constructed our ourselves whether we like it or not i mean it's it is um and you said last week something that that kind of peaked peaked my ear and i think peaked, peaked the ear of of our listeners but you said that money is not a social construct and by every conventional definition that i've looked at it very much is in theory money is just an agreed upon system of that it, it requires mutual buy-in for money to actually be valuable. Money could, in theory, be anything. There are properties that make certain money greater than, than others, right? Gold is probably a better money than loaves of bread because loaves of bread go bad. They expire. I certainly wouldn't want to hold loaves of bread as, as, as my money. Um, but what did you mean by it's not a social construct? Um, real quick on the last topic, I mm. just want to make my prediction by the way guys i could be wrong um so yeah I, real i think that's a really important point is that conversations like this are directionally attempting to find more signal and all of this shit and i think that we maintain the position of curiosity not that we or at least not that i am signal 
but the exploration of it. I think that they, I think people want authenticity. They mm. want a humble, almost like boyish like curiosity, uh, which I try and bring with you with Strike. Right. Um, that's what I think people want out of a medium like a podcast. Yes. Do I, do I, Think I'm right? Yeah, I do. <laughs> have I been right more than I've been wrong over the last decade? Yes, I have. Do I? Can I guarantee that I'm correct? No. There were there f- facts uh, that I just displayed. Like, are the banks functionally insolvent? Did the Fed bankrupt their own banks? Is the hyper inflationary environment of COVID and the deposits combined with the fastest rate ha- hike ever that crashed the bond market? and cause bank runs did that happen is that a fact yes right um so my prediction is the reason that they're not extending the program and that they got this fucking jackass on 60 minutes telling you i wouldn't do that i wouldn't do that i wouldn't do that is that when he does do that you know it was against his will is that he's here to, he has to it's like spider-man and flashing in the in the sky he has to save you if it were up to him, he wouldn't do it. So I think they need a political excuse. I mean, even I remember last summer, I told you looking at the bond market and looking at bank balance sheets, I was like, it's about time we find ourselves with a war in Middle East. And guys, I'm the furthest from politically in tune and understanding all this stuff. So I mean, no offense, and I carry no bias or opinion either which way. I'm human. I don't want anyone killing anybody. That's just always my position. I'm very pro love. So I don't mean to offend anyone or align politically in any way. But I did tell you it's about time we go to war. And I didn't know, I don't have any insider information about the military industrial complex or anything like that. But, um, that's how this goes. As you look at the Fed's balance sheet, you look at they need a political excuse to print money and to bail people out. And what's more emotionally, politically rallying than American war and, uh, you know, saving your deposit. So I think that you'll get war or some and slash or some f- big failure mm. by March, by the next hearing. So it's two months from now. No, no. Or a month. Yeah, I guess a month from now. It's February. February. Yeah. So I think you'll get something soon. And I think you already started to see it with the New York bank community. And and you're kind of seeing it in the Bitcoin price a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. And Bitcoin's just the mo- best expression of this problem of Keynesian economics, central banking bullshit. I think the Bitcoin market is telling you, whoa, 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 we're not off to the races just yet. So it was like Bitcoin was 42, 43, 44, 45, 46. And it looked like the thing was going to go right to 100K. And then it turned around. As soon as this jackass said, we're not cutting, we're going to stick to our guns. And we're, oh, really? I think what the market is saying, <laughs> oh, yeah, hot shot. You're going to let all your banks fail? The guys that collect deposits and give them back to you? You're going to let those guys go under? Okay, fine. I'll go sit in your 5.5% or whatever. The, I don't actually don't even know what the rate is. I'll go sit there. Let's see. Let's see how these things trade. Boom, next trading day, down 40%. And we'll see how the next few wait, weeks trade. Let's see how many of these small to medium banks get taken out to the back and shotguns through their head served up to all the bigger banks to take over for the FDIC to handle. And then, so I think that's what, and as soon as that Mm. happens, Bitcoin's going to take the cover. I think Bitcoin's going to rip the face off this market. I think Bitcoin's going to 200,000 to 1 million between that, which people are always like, that's such a wide range, you dick. Well, you're asking me to price something in a piece of paper that these guys print all the time. It's it's less of how high do I think Bitcoin's going to go. It's how much are these guys going to print? <laughs> like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> are they going to stimulate 10 trillion, 5 trillion, 15 trillion? You know, if they do four times as much as they did in COVID, yeah, it could go to a, a million. Right. If they do the same as COVID, yeah, it goes to 400K. 
they do half a COVID, 250K. So somewhere in that range. But I think Bitcoin shows you how fucked this thing really is. Mm. It's what Bitcoin does every time. Is it's like, oh, the S&P was up 49%. Gold did well. Gold was up 8%. What's that thing? Whoa, 160%. And that's the free market being like, they, your system's piece of trash. You can't control this thing. So we're going to tell you exactly how fucked your system is. So I think the system's really fucked. And the best way to uh, monetize that is to own Bitcoin. But the best way to express it, I think it puts up a big fuck you number over the next two years so let one, it be known one hell of a pet rock if if yes but if uh <laughs> if a bank goes down in two weeks and powell comes out oh and, we'll be right here to say i told you yeah so. in march or in is like i told you guys on tv didn't i that yeah. i wouldn't do it i told you that but then a bank failed what am i Oh, I hate when that happens. God damn it. <laughs> I have to print $10 trillion. Fuck. I really didn't <laughs> want to do that. That's my guess is what happens. We'll see. We'll be here to, to, to say I told you yeah. so. Um, if the, it does happen. So uh, money as a, as a social construct, the, uh, I see this all the time. I see people on the internet like, no, guys, you just don't get it. People got Bitcoin early. But when everyone agrees that Litecoin is money, you're all going to be regretting not buying Litecoin or Solana. Yeah, the, the dollar is money because we all agree it's money. And how are you going to unconvince people to think of the dollar as a piece of paper and not money? And I just want I actually put this to I think I told you I would want to talk about this because of what mm. I saw on the Internet. I think we should talk about what money actually is on the Money Matters podcast more because I think people don't understand. That's my my take. Money is a market good. Uh, it, it is a market good just like that computer is, just like this camera is, just like this microphone is. It is a very particular market good is you don't buy it to consume it. You buy it to exchange it later. But nonetheless, it's a market good that is is in the marketplace to perform very specific things. And so it's not up to a board or to a social construct or to what's trending on social media uh, to di dictate what money is. Money is the best performing technology in the marketplace for what money is supposed to achieve. And... I, so I don't know where you wanted to go with the topic, but I think I know like our friends don't know, understand money and not, sorry, not, I'm not trying to be offensive guys, but I just don't think people talk about it enough. I don't right. think it's, and it's purposefully not taught in schools in my opinion. Uh, and so when I see commentary on the internet of why I'm so confident in Bitcoin and why I don't think people can convince themselves that um, pink coin can be money. It's so nonsensical. It's it's just like it. I feel bad even arguing because you clearly don't understand the topic in the first place. Is it's not up to us. I used the example in, in the last show. I got it from Safedine. You know, if we all decided, like, hey, humanity, huddle up. From here on out, bananas are spaceships. Okay, do you agree? So. We're going to get to the moon with bananas from here on out. I know they're good. You cut them up, put a little honey on it. They taste great. But starting tomorrow, they're spaceships. It doesn't matter. They're not getting us to the moon. If you go up to the roof after this and you get on a banana and you jump, you'll die. Right. So social construct my ass. <laughs> and money's a technology just like a spaceship. And then so what, what, what makes a good money? Um, you, so let's think about what a money is here to achieve. So carrying that example real quick, um, if let's say instead of bananas, get us to the moon, let's say FTX coin is the new world reserve currency. And because of Sam Bankman Freed and he's raising all these big rounds, he's a genius and altcoins and shit coins are better than Bitcoin, blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. Um, and then you get on the banana and you jump off the roof. You buy FTX 
and you jump and you die and all your money's gone. And the way you solve this is when people <laughs> convince themselves and create social constructs that bad money can be good money, then mm. the market takes care of them very quickly. For people that think the dollar's been good money, they don't own a house, they don't own their education, they don't own a car, they get inflated to fuck all, right? And so the market takes, so anyway, um, what money is our technology to transmit value into the future? That's all it's supposed to do, literally. It's because the future, we don't, we can never predict the future. We don't know the future. And so we have to take value that we create today and put it somewhere for later. And that's that's really, at the end of the day, human 101, why we kick ass, is our ability to think and plan for the future. And money is the best way we can do that. And on the topic of safety, I think everyone should read the Bitcoin standard and all of his writings to get a real grounded sense of a lot of these topics, but the Bitcoin Standard is one of the best books about money, I think. One hundred percent. But that's yeah. that's it. It's 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 a technology to take value that you're creating now, and then use it and and bring it to the future. So, for example, um, let's say you work for Strike, and let's say instead of compensating you in dollars or in bitcoins, I compensated you in pieces of a house in the Florida Keys. Uh, and so if you work for me for four years, you will have keys to a home in the Florida Keys. Well, that's not necessarily, that's actually better, maybe better money than the US dollar, but it's not, the future's too uncertain. Right. What if your girl doesn't want to live in the Florida Keys? What if there's a hurricane? What if all of a sudden people don't like homes and they like condos? What if there's World War Three and we all evacuate? It's like that is not like a way, a good way for you to train. What if you only work for, at strike for two years and you quit? Well, you have half a home. Right. The future is uncertain. The future is uncertain. And so what you need is a monetary instrument that is hard to produce more. So you need an, you need an instrument that's hard to produce more of and that can be uh, exchanged. Uh, easily. So you, money needs to travel through both space and time. So I need to be able to hand it to you and I. I need to be able to move it. Uh, and it needs to be able to travel through space where it doesn't deteriorate like a banana in a week or in a month or mm -hmm. in a year. And that, generally speaking, is the like two most important properties of what a money needs to achieve in a market. But then the free market competes, right? And then we say, okay, is a banana or Bitcoin better at those two things, right? Is Bitcoin or Solana better at those two things, right? Um, but it's not a social construct. We don't all get to just sit and decide like we want blueberries to be money. Money's here to achieve very specific things. Mm. And if people aren't, I mean, do you do you see any threat to sort of? Well, I mean, okay, so. I do think some consensus is required. Consensus could be wrong, but consensus is required. Would you agree with that or no? No. If, why? Well, consensus amongst two. I mean, like money. At, at least more than one party. If you say blueberries are money, and I'm saying bananas are money, and the person over there is saying apples are money. But a, a medium of exchange a lot of these, the, the the other problem with economics and with money is people don't appreciate that these things happen naturally. So, in the example, let's let's do shoes. What are these? Converse. But what brand? Converse. Yeah. Okay. Converse. Converse. I'm wearing Nike. So let's say you produce and wear Converse. I produce and wear Nike. Hey, I'd like a pair of Converse and you'd like a pair of Nike. We coincidentally want, I coincidentally want what you have and have what you want, right? That's the coincidence of wants. Okay. Let's say I wanted Converse and you wanted Adidas. Okay. I would then have to find someone who makes Adidas 
that also wants Nike. And then I found someone who makes Converse that wants Adidas. What was the medium of exchange in our shoe trade? Nikes, right? I mm. used Nikes to connect Adidas and Converse. Mm. So naturally, these things occur. Like we don't need to agree to find a medium of exchange. We'll always have them. We have this problem of a coincidence of wants because unless you want an economy of like three people, what ends up happening, like if I walk into Whole Foods, guys, and I say, I will give you these Nikes for that steak or I will wash your car for that steak or so I'm the CEO of Strike. I will work on a new Strike feature for this bag of groceries. They're going to say, fuck you, I don't want that. You, we live in such a big economy where everyone now gets to hyper specialize, which is amazing. Like this fucking guy is just a butcher for meat. Think about that. He can't do like I can't. That's insane. He spends all day making sure that this meat is perfectly ready for me to grill. What a hyper specialized economy. And nowadays at the Internet, we live in an economy of like billions and billions and billions of people. And so. You need a a medium of exchange uh, that so anyway sorry the the medium of exchange naturally occurs so does that answer your question yeah no I think I think I think that it does um and so what what would you say then in terms of the dollar what's the biggest threat to the dollar in terms of being good money well a uh, fiat is only uh being used because of violence it wouldn't naturally emerge as a medium of exchange so on this point by the way of so carrying that example out is there's this coincidence of wants things thing and so we need a market good that isn't adidas or nike or converse that we can take the things we make so i make a lot of nikes i need to exchange it for a money and then if the money's good, then the money will be worth that or more in the future, and it will be able to travel distance where I could like exchange it for converse, exchange it for food and goods. So travel through space, travel through time. That's it. And so if I made a bunch of Nikes and I exchange it for bananas, the bananas would be bad money for me because in a week they'd go rot and they'd go bad. So if I made a bunch of Nikes, change it all for this. What a crazy example hearing myself talk out loud. If I <laughs> made a bunch of Nikes, changed it all for bananas, and then decided I wanted Converse a month later, and I went and I had rotten bananas. Those bananas are no good for you. So bananas don't hold their value through time, right? Neither does the U.S. dollar. Not because they go rot, but because the government makes so many more of them, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to find a money that is like this is where the term hard money comes from. You have to find a money that is hard to make more of so that they cannot take they being government. Sorry, but just generally, if the, you can find a lot more of them, then it's going to depreciate its worth in the marketplace. And so you need a good in the market. So when I work at strike, I'm exchanging that work for money. Right. Then I can take the money and I can go buy Converse or such. So. Uh, the dollar, uh, why is it bad? Mo I mean, I don't think the dollar would have ever naturally emerged as the preferred medium of exchange. Why would it? I don't want to hold it. The only reason I ever interface with it is because if I don't, I get thrown in prison. Got to pay your taxes. Right. So <laughs> just to be clear, that's the only way bad money is adopted is by violence. The only reason the US dollar is used is because if you don't, they'll show up, someone with a gun will show up to your house and tie your hands behind your back and throw you in a dark box for the rest of your life. That's another way of describing taxes and the product market fit of the US dollar. Mm -hmm. The US dollar has product market fit because if you don't use it, they will show up and put a gun to your face, hands up, with a with a loaded gun to your forehead and lock you up. That's why the U.S. dollar is adopted. It's a pretty good way to find 
product market fit, wouldn't you say? Yes. <laughs> but I think people, what people don't understand is money's not a social contract. So when, I, when I'm doing the Nikes thing, okay, I can exchange for bananas. I can exchange for blueberries. I can exchange for gold. I can exchange for U.S. dollars. I can exchange for Litecoin. I can exchange for Bitcoin. Which one do I think will do the job best? And so other properties come to mind. Liquidity. So I need it to be highly liquid so that at any time I can exchange it for things. So like think about how liquid bananas are or how liquid your friend's favorite shit coin is. So saleable, liquidity, divisible, easy to verify, hard and how hard it is to create more of it. Um, equitable, fair. How was the supply distributed? Who owns most of it? Can I get? Can I work really hard one day, exchange my energy and my time for money, and then some jackass that printed a bunch dump on my face? Mm. And so, what's your weapon of choice? If you think about money that way, which is what it is. Then it, it's the, so in the same way that if I get on a banana and I jump off the roof, I will die. I won't go to the moon, no matter how, what social constructs we strum up between ourselves. Doesn't matter. If I get on the U.S. dollar in my as my savings account and I jump, I will die. I will be poor. So the way the free market solves this in everyone's social constructs is just by making you poor if you adopt bad money, and if you adopt good money, then you'll get rich. Aggressive terminology. You will grow in purchasing power. Right. But I don't think people understand that. I don't think people understand that medium of exchanges naturally occur. And you don't need anyone. That's the pro. No offense, but the problem with your questioning is the propaganda that's told to us our whole lives of like, we need the government. Without the government, we would never agree to a medium of exchange and we would never want to spend money. That's the other thing, is like Powell's adjusting rates to get us to spend. I need to stimulate the economy. Jerome Powell needs to tell me that I need to spend money. No, I don't want to eat food or take my girl to a nice vacation or buy a big house because Jerome Powell adjusted the rate. I want that because I'm human. Newsflash, without a central planner, I'd still want to consume shit. <laughs> right? Yeah. Do you want to consume? Did you buy this outfit because Jerome Powell raised or lowered the rates? No. No, you, I just, like the shoes. you just want stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So humans naturally want things. Okay. We don't need a central planner to get us to want things any more or any less. Humans also naturally, like money is a natural phenomenon that scales the economy so that we can hyper fixate and specialize on things, which is good for the world. Mm. And medium of exchanges occur naturally because of the coincidence of wants. Unless you have what I want and I want what you have, it's not going to work. So medium of exchanges are natural. And money is a technology. The better the money, the better humanity. Because the better the money, the better we can take value to the future. Right. Yeah, and so, worded. so that is, so I don't know. Some, anyway, um, I know we both don't feel well, but, and, and it's late, but I get exhausted like reading this stuff sometimes because it's <laughs> like, he's like, no, you don't understand. Everyone already agreed that the dollar is money, or you don't understand. Everyone already agreed that Solana is money. It's like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> if money isn't up to us. It's mm. it's not up to your Discord group. Money is a market good. It competes in the market and it has a job to do. So whoever's best at that job is going to win. And if you don't agree with that, you're going to jump off the roof on a banana and you're going to die. You're going to be poor. FTX. And if you understand that, it's very simple. Why am I so confident about Bitcoin? Name me a, a monetary technology that's better in the market at what money is supposed to do. And so, and, and money concentrates, by the way. Like, 
there's not society doesn't want a thousand monies it wants one right and the sorry last thing for all these people are like well then when uh hyper bitcoinization we're we're in hyper bitcoinization like i'm not here for the price i'm here for the technology go fuck yourself the price is a literal index that tells us how much of the world thinks of Bitcoin as money, right? Literally. So it's like, what KPI do you look for at Bitcoin? Is it uh, the liquid block? Uh, is it the transactions per? The no, no, no. Of wallets. no, 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 no. The price. That's it. The price. That's it. The, that's it. Of course, like I, uh, I mean. Don't extrapolate that. I, I, of course, I look at a lot of shit. I'm, I'm interested by a lot of shit. And by the way, the technology is valuable. We're gonna do a lot of really cool things. Don't get me wrong. Play a podcast I've done over the years. I have a lot of great, uh, motivated opinions about the technology. It's phenomenal. It's really, really exciting. Um, but the price is the most important KPI because Bitcoin's money. Hmm. It, it, what we just described it is a medium of exchange. It is a money. It takes value that you're exchanging for it today and brings it to the future for you. Think of it like packs your bags. Like, come on, buddy. We're going to the future. We're going to protect. You put value in these bags. We're going to the future. Whenever you need these bags unpacked, I'm going to make sure they're protected for you. Pew! It's money. And so the price shows us in real time how much of the world in market cap is valuing this thing as money, is taking their energy and putting it into the money, Right? So whether I'm creating Nike's Converse, the price just tells us how much of humans are saying, okay, I'm creating value for society. I'm going to store it in this one instead of this one. Mm-hmm. And so when people are like, when, when super cycle, we're in a motherfucking super cycle. Every single low is higher than the last. Every single high is higher than the last. So every single cycle, more of us humans are taking our value and we're putting it into this one. We're living in a super cycle. Oh, I'm sorry. Was it just supposed to never go down? Don't be a bitch. <laughs> right? But we're living in it. And the like higher lows, higher highs, everyone around the world is creating value and looking around and like, what money is the best technology to take my life and protect it into the future? So, not a social construct. Then what's the... if? Price is the only KPI that matters. What's the biggest threat to Bitcoin? Is it the price declining? Um, no. Well, th- again, I don't view the price as anything other than a real-time index on how good the money is performing. So that mu- if, if Bitcoin went to zero, for me, that means that the world found a better money than Bitcoin. Mm. Again, money is a market good. It operates in the market. So you can buy and sell many things. You know, if you wanted your next payroll from Strike to be in bananas, I can make it happen. It's up to you. You have a pl- a market preference. I'm good. Right. I'm good. But the point is, <laughs> you could get it in these chairs. You have a market preference. You choose which market good you want. Now, money is specifically a good that you don't consume very important that you're buying it to then exchange it later. You're buying it to take the value you're putting into it and bring it to the future. Right. Um, but it's a market good. So if that market good goes to zero, that means no one's creating value and exchanging it into that thing. They're exchanging it into something else. So if it goes to zero, it means we found a better money. So actually, maybe that's the answer. Is the biggest threat to Bitcoin is humanity creates a better money? I don't think so. Um the biggest threat to Bitcoin, I so I I'm a huge Arthur Hayes fan. Um, I think he's genius. I love his macro shit. He's fucking hilarious. Also, uh, I love his uh, Bitcoin's price equals technology plus fiat liquidity. Um, I think that's great. And so the fiat liquidity piece, like I've always thought, along with many other Bitcoiners, that if uh, the U.S. went back onto a gold standard. They said, fuck it, the banks are going to fail, the empire's over, we got to run this shit back and learn from what we went through. Uh, we're going back on a gold standard, we're going to restrict the supply of the dollar. I think Bitcoin would have a tougher time going up. I still think it would, um, but I think 
the biggest accelerant to Bitcoin adoption is fiat liquidity. Um, and so if they actually acted moral and ethical and sane, the adoption cycle would probably take longer. Mm. Um, and then I also think Bitcoin, here's another impo important point just for the listeners. Bitcoin is a, a network. Um, Bitcoin itself is just computer software. So Bitcoin without any humans enforcing it is unused computer code. It is all of us that actually make up and comprise Bitcoin. It was an, it's a network of people that have a shared belief in uh, hard money that protects us all. And, and Bitcoin is beautiful in this way where every single 10 minutes we bow down to Bitcoin. Well, uh, the way I think, seriously, the way I think about it is every Bitcoin block, Bitcoin says, you are my bitch. <laughs> I do. It's a it's being a bitcoiner is this is for maybe another episode is the most humbling experience of my entire life. And every 10 minutes bitcoin says, "Do you or do you not agree to my rules?" There will only be 21 million. If you try and create more than that, you are kick, kicked off. You have to sign transactions this way. No, I like signing. No. And you bow every every ten minutes. Humanity, think about all the people around the world that are interested in this thing, use this thing. Say Bitcoin. A new block was found. Bitcoin is speaking. Yes, Bitcoin. We agree to the fixed supply. <laughs> yes, Bitcoin. We will sign our transactions this way. Yes, Bitcoin. We understand that there's only this amount of space in the block. Yes, Bitcoin. And and that's the only answer. And that's the only answer. And so that network is. It's all us humans that that fight and comprise that network and support that network and and bow down and support the rules and protect those rules and so without those humans so i guess the other thing would say i would say is if there are if there isn't a desire to protect the future of our species and fight for a good money then bitcoin has no purpose if we want an economy where we say fuck it let's just lend our money to the us government forever they're going to privatize gains and socialize losses. You know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're just going to lend to the government, um, the people that are VPs and presidents of the corporations, they get the bonuses. And if they fuck up, we all lose. And that's the world we want as human beings. Then Bitcoin serves no purpose. But if we're resilient, if we're prosperous, if we're tough, if we're innovative, all the things that make being human human, then uh, Bitcoin's going to win, right? But that's the other thing to keep in mind is that without human beings, there's no network. I don't know if that answers your question, but I don't think Bitcoin has any real threats, if I'm being honest with you. Mm. Call me cocky. Damn. I think that's a great sentiment to end the episode on. I mean, I think we can go into uh, a little bit of Q&A. One of my favorite segments here, and uh, and so, call it. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can keep this part in, Scooty. It's so hot in here. Man. It's fuck. I'm dying. And we're both like not feeling too well. I for the listeners, um, it's so fucking. We're hot not here. low energy. <laughs> I think we're just a little under the weather. Um, hopefully this is a good enough episode for you guys. But then it's also really hot in here. Um, but uh, yeah, let's do some Q and A. What questions do we have? Hot, tired, sick. Fuck it. No, well, we on, get on that. Out yeah, on, on that, that, that point, I, you guys got my word. Every single Monday, I will be in a hospital bed and I'll give you guys an episode. So, uh, yeah, there's something going through Chicago. Um, For sure. So, For sure. I don't know. It's no big deal. Um, not, not, to, not to be a bitch myself. Uh, but, um, yeah, you probably hear it in my voice, the, the energy of screaming and yelling, um, I'll get back to it. I am. I saw this sick. question come through and I thought it was, uh, mm -hmm. I thought it was fucking awesome. So appreciate, uh, you posting this question. Um, a user on Twitter at Colin MKA asked three questions, but, but I really liked <laughs> his third question, um, which was. Would you trade Bitcoin for more time on this earth? 
or pass it on to kids and let nature decide when you go? Oh, um, do I get to quote myself? Sure. Um, I'm going to, uh, this is how, uh, uh, ill I feel. I'm going to botch my own quote. It's, um, the point isn't to live forever. It's to help create something that will, uh, that is I, how I think about Bitcoin. Um, would I trade it for more time? If I found out I was going to die tomorrow, would I sell some Bitcoin to live till I was 80? Yeah. But would I trade it for infinite time? No. Mm. I think that death is one of the most important. It's the only promise you have in being alive is that you'll die. And it's invaluable to life itself. If I didn't know that I was going to die, um, or if, if I was promised that I wasn't going to die, why would I ever go to the gym? Why would I ever get married? Why would I ever catch a sunrise? Why would I ever make friends? Why would I ever fall in love? Why would I ever try new foods? Why would I ever travel? I'm going to live infinitely. How would you ever value your time? I'll go to the gym in 3,000 years. I don't give a <laughs> fuck. Um, so I... Death is what gives your life value, which, by the way, uh, on I think this was many years ago, we had a conversation um, in Los Angeles where I tried to draw the analogy what death is to life, Bitcoin is to money. Because if you think about it, if you're you live infinitely. Yeah, well, I'm just going to play Xbox for the next thousand years and then maybe in year thousand and one, I'll try and fall in love and get in shape. Who cares? Who gives a fuck? When it's unlimited supply of time, it's impossible to value it. If your supply of time is fixed, then it gives the actual experiences that you have in this life an immense amount of value. Same thing with money. This infinite amount of dollars, it's very hard to value these things and to actually build a economically reasonable like society. Um, but if you cap the supply of monetary energy that could be uh, created in this world in Bitcoin, then all of a sudden I think humanity finds a uh, really, really easy time valuing money. So I think death to life, Bitcoin to money. That's awesome. Uh, user Brentonator1 asked, can you also touch on the issues or perceived issues regarding scalability of lightning? As a non-techie, I don't understand the details, but I've seen quite a few concerns regarding scalability of Lightning. Um, this topic uh, kind of bothers me. Well, first things first, um, there's stuff that I wouldn't say, well, I, there's stuff like I've gotten wrong, for sure. Um, well, wrong, I think, is maybe the wrong word, but uh, I think the community was generally like very excited and um so before you know there's um i can already see people i think it's just important to acknowledge uh that with that being said i think it's um you got to find the success metric it was like the kansas city chiefs are such a failure of an organization over the last five six years really the third dynasty well it depends <laughs> it depends did was your success metric that they won the super bowl every single year well, then, yeah, they're a failure. Is your success metric that they made the playoffs? 10 out of 10, perfect. In fact, they've been the AFC Championship game every single year Mahomes has been a starter, right? Yep. And so that's how I view a lot of Bitcoiners. Lightning, for me, or what was it, all, all layer two? So liquid, lightning. lightning. Lightning, to me, has been a smashing success. You have a open value transfer protocol for the internet. Anyone can transfer physical cash final value from their balance sheet as a corporation or, or from themselves to someone else globally. It's insane. I mean, we're like our company, we're reinventing cross border payments with a community of people interoperating with us on a new internet native value transfer protocol. That's fucking incredible. Oh, your success metric was that 8 billion people would have a lightning node on their phone? Yeah, no, we're behind, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, yeah. and and I and it really bothers me when I go people will send me tweets or I'll be scrolling on Twitter and you know <laughs> some people who I don't even know these people are are, be, are tweeting like 
dear Bitcoin community, you guys make it go faster. Think about it. If Bitcoin was instant and scaled to all 8 billion people, it would be better than Satoshi ever dreamed of. Think about where the price would be. Guys, stop arguing. Make it faster. It's like, oh, it's that's the, the age-old meme. I'm new to Bitcoin and I'm here to fix it. It's like, oh, dude, how did I not think of that over the 11 years I've been in Bitcoin? <laughs> Thank God you're here, you fucking genius. Make it go What'd you say? Faster. Make it go faster. I can't believe we didn't think of that. <laughs> of all the brilliant cryptographic engineers and people like Dorsey and Sailor and presidents of countries, make it go faster. Oh, we should have known. Fucking asshole. <laughs> it's a lot harder than it looks. So yeah, anyway, right. the combination of I'm new to Bitcoin and I'm here to fix it. Um uh go fuck yourself. And uh, the other is to find your success metric. Jack Dorsey can get physical value onto my balance sheet in less than a second at virtually no cost over the internet. Visa can't do that. Swift can't do that. Um, that that thing's a failure. Oh, really? According to who? I don't think so. Um, and I know, like our business, we don't think so. Our numbers don't think so. Uh, but okay, but yes, our you know our um whatever endangered children in some fucked up part of the world pissed about ordinals. I think you're. I think you're in a Western part of society making that up in your head. I don't think you've flown to El Salvador and talked to these people, but you know maybe right. Uh, right? But I don't know. Anyway, that's my take. I think Layer Two Solutions are doing fine. Um, by the way, too, in this like Bitcoin's price equals technology plus fiat liquidity, if the technology was done and we had infinitely scalable P2P, uh, hardest money ever cash, price wouldn't be $40,000. Right. Um, that's part of. So for guys like me, uh, it's a lot less of this doomsday. I'm new to Bitcoin. I'm here to fix it. Bullshit is let's get to work. Um, no shit. The price, yeah, the price isn't forty million dollars per Bitcoin because if everyone in Africa that had a Nokia flip phone was running a Lightning node, um, then yeah, no, pr no, trust me, price wouldn't be forty thousand. So we got work to do. What did yep. I got off my ass? I started a fucking company. Um, so yeah, I understand. There's a lot of the future that hasn't been realized. What am I going to do about it? Respond to your tweets? No, I'm going to get to work. Um. But I think it's phenomenal. I think it's it's literally incredible that I mean, how many how many nodes are on the Visa network, uh, right? Like it, you know, th this technology can disrupt an immense amount of shit if we never wrote another line of code. And I don't know who told you that was a failure, but it no. Seem fired up at that one. <laughs> I, know, I was I was actually uh, sitting on my couch watching the sixty minutes Jerome Powell. And there's a tweet of, I actually don't even know, I'll see if I can find it, but I don't even really know the person, but it was, you know, to the Bitcoin community, uh, guys, make it faster. What are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, there's, you gotta be fucking kidding me. That to have the, this, the lack of self-awareness, but it's something that happens time and time again, all the time. There's people show up like, oh, I have a Wall Street background, or I have an ETF background, or I have a venture capital background. Let me tell you here. Based on my experience, make it quicker. Make it go faster. Oh, 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 okay, God. That's what they teach in Silicon Valley. Make it go faster. Okay, yeah. Suck my dick. Fuck you. Yeah, I think that's an interesting part about getting into Bitcoin is that it's not lost on me how close to perfect this thing is, but it's also not lost on me how much time it took me to realize that. Um. It's just when you're new to something, you like a blanket assumption is that it can be optimized somehow. Yeah, well, yeah, and it's fair. I guess I'm being a little hard, but um, the other thing would taking it back to the conversation we we're having about money. Uh, the other hilarious thing is the market will 
correct it for you. You get on a banana, you think you're going to the moon, you will die. You think you can fix Bitcoin, you fork it, you create Bitcoin cash, now you're poor. And yep. so there's been a lot of people, if for all those that are newer to the space and want to learn some history, Google Bitcoin Cash, Google Bitcoin uh, XT, Google, um, gosh, uh, I mean, there's a million Bitcoin forks that thought they could do Bitcoin better and their coins now worth zero. So, yeah. Um, and and the other, we're just tying this episode together. The other thing to take away from this conversation on this topic is that Bitcoin is the most humbling thing. It's just an unforgeable ball of truth you cannot convince it of anything like you cannot explain past life experiences to it it doesn't give a fuck oh you want to make me go faster go ahead github.com slash bitcoin <laughs> go ahead go ahead and you realize oh shit i don't know how to code i don't know how to do any of this shit yep. oh my god i don't know any i don't know how money works i don't know anything i actually pro probably should ask questions and find ways to contribute and humble myself and i was there for the record yeah. i was 18 years old and i showed up into bitcoin because my dad got me into it and i'm like yeah i'm here to fix it and contribute I'm like no you just get your ass kicked you get humbled like a motherfucker so well shit i think that's all we have uh for this episode and like we said rain or shine Hopefully you're not in the hospital, but we will be here next week. Yeah, sorry about being under the weather, but we want to get this out for you guys. Um, please keep asking questions. Um, they're really valuable to us. Uh, we want to have an active conversation with the community. That's the whole point of this thing. We're not trying to go viral. We want to be a piercing ball of truth every single week where the Bitcoin community wants to siphon through Jerome Powell, the Lightning Network, what money actually is. And we think it's fun. We think it's valuable. So appreciate you guys. We'll be on the lookout and uh, we'll talk to you in a week. 